Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Sylvia and today's case is so frustrating and so sad. It does involve the deaths of four children, so I know that that might be a little bit of a sensitive subject, but today's case is about Larry Delisle and the story of him and what happened to his four children. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. It's free, it takes just a few seconds of your time, and it really, really helps me out. Out. And without further ado, let's get into the case. Lawrence Delisle was your classic all-American man. He was born in Detroit and he had lived there almost his entire life. He met his wife Susan when they were in high school and they later dropped out to get married. Together, they had four kids before either of them reached the age of 30. And these kids were Brian, Catherine, Melissa, and Emily. And that is actually like the age of the kids, like in order. This story takes place in Detroit, which is the center of the automotive industry. And cars will play a really important role in this story. So Lawrence, also known as Larry, I'll probably switch between both names as I talk through this case. So, but he worked at an auto shop as a service manager and they drove an American manufactured car, a Ford, and their oldest son had started to take on America's favorite pastime, baseball. Larry was really excited about this because baseball was also his favorite sport, so he was just overjoyed that his oldest child was also taking an interest in it. They were just your classic all-American family, but sadly, all of that changed on August 3rd, 1989. Larry drove his wife and all four of their children to the local furniture store where they looked at beds. They decided not to buy anything, but because it was such a hot summer night, Larry took all of the kids to go get frozen custard. As they start to eat their ice cream, one of the kids asks Larry if they could go down to the river and watch the boat sail by. This is something they'd done plenty of times and they actually had done the exact same activity the night before. But Larry's like, yeah, I mean, we don't have any more plans for the rest of the night, why not? So they eat their ice cream as they're watching the boats go by, but the youngest child, Emily, was teething. So she starts crying and this is when they decide to go home. However, Suzanne wants to stop at a drugstore and I think it was like to get something for Emily's teething. But yeah, they decide to stop really quickly at the drugstore and then according to Larry, as he's pulling out of the parking lot, he makes a wrong turn. Instead of turning right towards the main road, he turns left and they're facing the river again. And as they're driving along just after 9 p.m., Larry's leg starts to cramp. And he worked a job where he had to be on his feet all day and he had worked like a 10 hour day. So his legs had been really, really bothering him. But this cramp was so bad that the leg seized up and he says that like he lifted it, but just like didn't, like couldn't hold it and it fell down and slammed down on the gas pedal. The car goes speeding towards the river and before they know it, this entire family has driven through the metal barrier and into the water. The car plunges into the River Rouge, which is a very deep and flowing river. The windshield actually shatters and Larry and Suzanne are able to swim through the open windshield and to the surface. The car sinks very quickly. Larry actually says that as soon as him and Suzanne break through the surface and take their first breath of oxygen, they turn around and the trunk of the car is already going beneath the water's surface. And they can kind of see the headlights, but the car is completely submerged. And Larry can't swim and he's actually afraid of deep water. So he was only able to bob up and down while Suzanne then ducks back under the water and tries to free their children. She actually manages to swim all the way down to the car, but she's not able to get any of their seat belts or car seats undone. So she has, she has to swim back up to the surface. Luckily, somebody had been watching in a high-rise apartment building overlooking the River Rouge, so they're able to call 911 immediately. Even though they arrive very quickly, it's too late, and all four children had drowned. The divers have to dive down and bring them up to the surface one by one, and they determine that the children had died in the reverse order of which they were born. So, 
it went eight-month-old Emily, two-year-old Melissa, four-year-old Catherine, and eight-year-old Brian. In just the blink of an eye, Larry and Suzanne had lost all four of their children. Because this story is so tragic, it spreads like wildfire, and soon the entire state of Michigan knows what happened to the Delisle family. And with this naturally comes media coverage, and Larry and Suzanne are harassed from the start. Larry says that the media were outside his house constantly and they were badgering them to do an interview and eventually he and his wife cave and agree to do a televised interview however before this interview a family member offers larry two valium pills and he'd never taken this drug before he didn't know how potent it was so when he's sitting there in the interview larry says he barely knows where he is he can barely hear the questions like he says that his clearest memory from this entire interview is when he noticed a plane flying overhead so he's completely out of it and you can tell in the interview that something is off however in the eyes of the public they take this as somebody who is not sad enough over the death of their four children. The interview turns the public against the couple because they don't seem like they're grieving parents. They just seem very apathetic. And Larry and Suzanne say that the public didn't see how often they cried behind closed doors. Before they left their house, they would always compose themselves. They didn't want to be sobbing messes in public. But of course, this isn't something that people like understand. This is just like the most frustrating and sad case because Larry is so unlucky in all of this. He is unlucky from like the start of the accident, the way the public see him is unlucky. And then what's even worse is that the police ask him to come into the station to ask a few questions and Larry happily agrees because he also wants to find out what happened that night. He is just completely shocked over the fact that something so horrible could happen in just under 10 seconds. So Larry goes into the station and the police ask him to tell them what happened as the car was driving towards the river. And Larry tells them the same situation about how his leg cramped up and then how his foot slammed down on the accelerator. However, when he took his foot off the accelerator, it remained stuck down. Therefore, the car was just speeding towards the river and there was no way to slow it down. Basically, it was like his foot was still on the accelerator pedal, even though he had removed it. And Suzanne looked over and was like, what are you doing? And then realized that something was going on because his feet were not on the accelerator pedal. However, the car was just increasing in speed going towards this body of water. She tries to grab the steering wheel and like turn it, but they're not able to do anything. It's just a few seconds and their car goes into the water. So in order to corroborate Larry's story, the police need to do tests on the car and they pull it out of the river and they pull back the carpeting and they realize that there's blood all over the bottom of it. Larry's children were not the first to die in this vehicle. Larry's father had taken his own life with a gun in the front seat of the car just 18 months earlier. People immediately found it really weird that Larry would want to keep this car that literally still had blood stains in the bottom of it, but his reasoning was that he and his family had been cut out of the will so that his dad's girlfriend could get his entire estate when he died. So she was already inheriting the house and she gave Larry and his wife this car as a gift. Larry was uncomfortable at the idea of driving around in the same vehicle that his father had ended his life in, but he says that the car that he and his wife currently had had a lot of issues. It was just way too expensive for them to maintain, so they were just kind of like backed into a corner, and he let Suzanne take the car out for a drive, and she loved it, and oddly enough, they really liked the amount of horsepower it had. They liked that it could speed up quickly which, you know, is really morbid now, but they decide to keep the car, even though there are bloodstains underneath the floorboard. 
So as part of their investigation, the police look under the hood of the car and they don't notice anything out of the ordinary. It's not like there have been any wires cut. It's not like any parts are visibly damaged. They also do tests on a track that is the same length as the point where the car sped up and the point where it went into the river. They determine that this whole ordeal took place over just seven seconds. So basically what the cops end up doing is starting at that starting point and then just accelerating the same exact vehicle over and over again to see like how fast it would get up to. And they determined that it was going 40 miles per hour in that seven second period. And because Larry's story revolves around the accelerator pedal getting stuck, the police basically do this test a bunch of times. They speed the car up and then they slam on the brakes to see what will happen. And on the 30th try in this car, the accelerator pedal got stuck. And the investigator that was driving the car, I forget if he, if he like slammed on the brakes or if he like pulled the emergency brake or if he like put it in park, but he was able to do something and they all get out and they're like, okay, like the accelerator pedal did get stuck down. And actually to go with Larry's story is the fact that that exact model of Ford vehicle had multiple complaints from customers that the accelerator pedal would get stuck down. So this, you know, completely goes with Larry's story. Despite all of this, investigators were able to stop the car before it hit that point of getting into the water. And this is what makes the Downriver Police Department very suspicious of Larry. They invite him in to do another interview, and Larry is under the impression that they're going to help him remember what happened the night that his children died. And sadly, this is all part of the police strategy. They hook him up to a lie detector test. They interview him for eight hours straight without sleep or food and no attorney present. So I wanted to include actual footage from Larry's interrogation, but unfortunately it is copyrighted by Netflix. So you can watch clips from his interrogation on the confession tapes, which is on Netflix now. And yes, I'm sorry about that. So the conductor of this lie detector test just keeps asking Larry if there was some part of him that wanted his children to die. And Larry holds out strong. He's like, no, like I loved my family. This is the worst thing I could have ever imagined happening. And the interviewer is like trying to like be his friend, but he's telling him these like really creepy stories. Like, once he's like, oh God, when my kids cry, I just fantasize about taping their mouths shut, throwing them in a trash bag and putting them in the closet. And you can like hear Larry in the recording, like what? Like he, he was like, can't you just like turn up the music and like kind of ignore them? And then there's this other story that the investigator tells him. And he's like, yeah, like I love driving in my car and slamming on the accelerator and speeding it up and scaring my wife. Were you maybe just trying to like, play a joke on your family, Larry? Is that why you accelerated the car? And Larry is like, no, I didn't mean to accelerate the car. It was because my leg cramped up. And just hours and hours go by and Larry is just exhausted. And he kind of starts like parroting back what the investigator is asking him. And this is actually like the biggest sign that a confession is a false confession. It's when the person is basically just sitting there in kind of like a hypnotic state and they're just like repeating what the investigator is saying to them. And eventually Larry does admit that perhaps there was a evil side of him, like a dark subconscious side of him that wanted his kids to die. And the police take this coerced confession and they run with the theory that this was all an attempted murder-suicide. And Larry is arrested on four counts of first-degree murder with the murders of his children, and then one count of attempted murder, and that is for his wife. 
So the town that they're living in is called Down River and the trial takes place just like one town over, but it's still a suburb of Detroit. And a lot of people argue that this was not far enough away in order for the jury to be impartial. The story had spread all over Michigan at this point and there was this angry mob growing throughout Down River and downtown Detroit against the Delisle family. In fact, they are harassed so badly that a bomb threat is called into their house. They also have multiple trespassers on their property. And while Larry is awaiting his trial, Suzanne actually has to move houses. In court, they never show footage of Larry's interrogation. And this actually is what a lot of people feel like kind of hurt. Larry because they just hear the police verbally say what Larry told them and it doesn't give the jury the chance to see the way Larry was manipulated into making this incriminating statement. The prosecution argues that Larry deliberately planned this crash in order to end all of their lives on that August night. The prosecution also brings up another incident that came out in Larry's interrogation. And this is a story of when their oldest child, Brian, was just an infant. Larry left an open candle next to a leaky gas pipe in hopes that the house would blow up while he and his wife and baby were asleep. And I didn't really find much information on this. Um, it was just in like a few articles, which is basically like the exact information I just told you. And it was not in Netflix's The Confession Tapes. So the woman that lived in the high rise that witnessed this whole event happening and who called 911 was a major witness for the prosecution because she actually used to sit out on her balcony every single night and look at the river. And she also loved people watching. She said that her neighbor actually had like a set of binoculars so that you could like watch people down on the street. And the fact that the family had done the exact same drive up to the riverside the night before, and then the fact that they did it one more time before the car drove into the water, this woman said it seemed like these were test drives for the actual, you know, suicide attempt. Larry's wife vouches for him in court saying, no, I was in the car with him. He was shocked when it started accelerating towards the river. I looked over, I could see his feet, neither of which was on the gas pedal. But I don't know, They, if his wife is standing by him, it just makes sense to me that like, that's the person you would believe, not somebody who was like over a hundred feet away sitting on their balcony, not in the car. The jury deliberates for nine hours before finding Lawrence Delisle guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Larry is currently serving out his sentence in Coldwater, Michigan. He has appealed this conviction multiple times with no luck. His wife used to visit him in prison until they mutually agreed that she should move on and now she's married and has a different family. And Larry is just living out the rest of his life grieving the family that he once had. Larry has now spent the better part of three decades behind bars for something that really just seems like it was an accident. Like the police were saying that like they were able to stop the car every single time, but at the same time, they didn't have the element of surprise that Larry had. He didn't know any of this was gonna happen. He was just an average guy driving down the street. I just feel like everybody who was in Down River at the time of this incident is just so unsympathetic to Larry and his situation. I feel like when people go through traumatic events, other people love to be like telling them how they could have prevented it or like how they should be acting, how they should be grieving. And you can't tell somebody who's in this unique, horrible, traumatic, upsetting situation how to act because you are not in the same situation as them. 
And of course, hindsight is 2020. Yeah, he could have done things to try to stop the car. He could have swerved out of the way. But in like seven seconds, I don't think that that is enough time at all. This case will just really make you lose faith in humanity because Larry Delisle was not treated fairly by the legal system, by the police, by society. He really just bared the brunt of every negative thing in this case. Everyone so quickly started pointing the finger at Larry without really even bothering to hear his side or give him the benefit of the doubt. So because Larry has exhausted all of his appeals, the only chance for him to get out of prison is for him to be granted clemency by the governor of Michigan. And I will be putting a change.org petition in the description of this video. So please take the time out of your day to sign this petition because it's really close to the amount of signatures it needs to get. And once the governor looks at it, hopefully Larry will be able to spend at least a small portion of his life a free man. But luckily, he has been able to find a support group of other people in the jail that are serving life sentences. And now he says he feels like very supported and it's not nearly as horrible as it was when he first entered prison. But of course, you know, he deserves to be free. But yeah, I mean, I think my opinion on this case is pretty clear. I would love to hear your opinions down below. If you think that Larry intentionally drove his car into the river or if this was all just a horrible accident or if you think that he was treated unfairly by the police please comment down below. I love hearing your opinions on these cases. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button as well. It supports me and my channel. And if you like true crime, then I'm sure you'll love the other videos that I have planned. Until next time, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day and stay safe.